各位好，这里是新疆电视台新闻演播室，欢迎收看正在直播的新疆新闻。Watch this! What a great choice of music to depict the supposed doom and gloom of Xinjiang in front of our eyes. This forced labor program detained and imprisoned more than one million people far under the state minimum wage. They cannot refuse. They cannot walk away. It is one of the latest hatch job to serve as evidence that a British university reporter uses in an attempt to show forced labor exists in. Xinjiang. Why is it that a news report about the government labor transfer program becomes evidence of forced labor? That's the point. The reports and the collective West are redefining the definition of forced labor to suit political ends. Deeply at these documents and try to decipher how a job recruitment program that has been running for the past five decades has suddenly been turned into forced labor. The series of reports produced by the Helena Kennedy Center of Sheffield Hallam University have been widely cited by the U.S. media and the government as a basis for sanctions on Xinjiang. Here is a timeline of the reports. But before we dive into the reports, we'd like to spend a few minutes on the people behind. Here is the CV of Laura Murphy, who has authored all the four papers from the university that look at Xinjiang. From 2019 to 2020, Ms. Murphy received a national endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar Award, a amount of 60,000 U.S. dollars. The NEH is a U.S. government agency that aims to strengthen the republic. And her research was also funded with grants of three million from U.S. Department of Justice. Before receiving funding from the U.S. government institution, Murphy focused primarily on African American slavery and injustice in North America. Then she suddenly shifted her academic focus to Xinjiang after she began receiving U.S. government funding. On social media, she often tweeted about World Week Congress, a far-right group made up of Uyghur separatists, connected with terrorist group like ETIM, and funded by the U.S. regime change organization, the NED. The author's connection with terrorist groups is even clearer if we cast our eye to Nairola Ilima, the other major author of the reports. In a piece she wrote for New Yorker, she admitted that her cousin Maila Yakov was arrested because of terrorist connections, and she has appeared at the notorious Cameroon court, the Uyghur Tribunal. According to her LinkedIn profile, Nairo's first and only work was at the Helena Kennedy Center after she obtained a bachelor degree in retail management in 2020. Why would an undergraduate in management, without any significant published work, be offered a very senior writing position at the center? The Helena Kennedy Center itself is also an interesting case to have a look at. The patron of the center, Helena Kennedy, is a known xenophobe. She founded the extremist political bloc, the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, and has been personally sanctioned by China. Let's go to the documents. In the acknowledgement section of the center's paper from May last year, we find Tim Sui Gross, who has organized Tibetan separatist event, and Nathan Ruser of ASPI, to name just a few.、Mm-hmm. The people behind the report seems to have all the connections to the usual places. But let's go to the key question: How do they establish the case for forced labor? <laughs> Far under the state minimum wage. Let's do some simple math. According to one of the workers at a textile company in the city of Kuala, he earned about 4,000 yuan a month, way above the regional minimum wage. If you think that's a single event, check out the average numbers. The per capita annual disposal income of Xinjiang workers who have participated in the program is about 30,000 to 40,000 yuan, also above the regional average. If that's not convincing enough, we actually went to Xinjiang and asked real people. Here's interview from Hoshan, a silicon industrial company, a major target of the reports. Both employers and employees find the accusation ridiculous. 当时我是在网上看到的，然后过来应聘的这个和深硅业。嗯，那
那之后会考虑在这边工作吗？肯定呀、啊，都挺好的，都挺好的，工资方面呀，然后，嗯，条件呀啥的，都各个都挺好的，都能习惯。那么政府就是提供一个平台，或者提供一个，一个通过一个媒介或者宣传，那这个也很正常，其实劳动局，但是强迫劳动，他肯定是违背劳动者的意愿，强行采取强制措施，那我们这里根本就不存在。What makes the reports more dubious is they lack proper referencing. Whenever they throw out another accusation, we see no elaboration, no reference to original source. Experts have determined that which expert? Some private and state-owned enterprise, which enterprises, and also prison labor is most illegal and practiced around the world. A widely circulated government-issued document. What documents? And in places, we see citations that already have been proven fake, and citations from ASPI publications which have been debunked time over time. When they do provide evidence, we see Chinese media reports being deliberately misinterpreted. Check out this piece of evidence from a Xinhua report. The person in the article talks about how happy she is to work an industrial job, how her salary increased to 4,000 yuan. And Murphy and Narora report said it showed a Uyghur girl was unwilling to accept the transfer. We hear about how a translation movement, the Great Translation Movement, is trying to present a real China, and we could kindly ask them to translate this piece for Murphy's team. And in the series of reports covering Xinjiang's cotton industry, solar and PVC, and so on, the author seems to want to establish that forced labor is endemic in the region. But all the reports had the same problem. They spent all their time trying to chase supply chains involved in Xinjiang companies, rather than providing evidence about how forced labor exists in the first place. This seems to be less a concern with human rights and more a parroting of the political and economic interests of the U.S. The Sheffield Hallam University reports are detrimental to its own academic credibility and part of the increasingly desperate disinformation campaign from the West. It is a Potomac village. It is swallowing in the mire. It is war in the making.